All right, everyone, we are back. Hello. Again, unbeknownst to some of you, this is our second go at this particular podcast. So, recorded yesterday. Mm -hmm. Rachel's wearing the same clothes as she did yesterday. I wasn't going to mention that. But thank you for pointing it out for the entire world to know. The entire world. All 41 of you that listened or viewed last time. But... We had, I tried to do this in a different way. I tried multi-channel recording. One of the things about the podcast are, I don't have a lot of time right now to edit these, but I have to do, I have to do all the editing myself. And Yeah, sorry, that's on you. <laughs> it's probably not the worst because I'm able to listen to it and hear all the mistakes I'm making, which is terrible for my ego or whatever you want to call it. I guess it's my whole psyche is, is taking a massive hit, but that's okay. However, you essentially have to go through and, and hit one or two, depending on which camera, uh, and change the camera angles manually the whole way through. But I found a software that would do this automatically for me, so I wanted to try it out. So we tried multi-channel audio. We were here for about an hour and a half hour. I mean, it was a long podcast, and... I was super psyched about it, got home, got all the stuff loaded up, and essentially my audio did not work for at least half of it. Nobody cared what you had to say. They just wanted to listen to me. That is true. However, (laughs) it's going to sound awfully weird with faint talking from me in the background while your professional audio over there was working. So I'm sorry. It's all good. This is round two. We're going to see. Hopefully this one's better. I don't know. I, I'm not going to lie, I was as frustrated as I've probably ever been, but you know what? It's a process. That's all I can, that's all I can say at this point. It's a process. Everybody's like, how's the podcast coming? It's a process. I don't have to love it. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to have a love-hate relationship with it. You got to stay the course the best way you can, so. I think that's how I describe everything as a love-hate relationship. That's how I feel about you. Talking about you. So. Cool. I kid. (laughs) But yesterday, we did something different. We have our first, I have my first actual interview coming up on Thursday, and we thought this would be the perfect time for me to actually interview Rachel. Practice round. I thought it was great. Version two. It was great. I'm never going to be able to remember anything that I asked, but that's okay. I won't be able to remember anything I said. You wouldn't have done that regardless. That's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, it's who I am. So I'm okay with that. You do a great job of being you. I I can say with any flaws or anything that comes along with it, you are very authentically you, which is, I think, it's what I appreciate the most. I mean, I tried. Like, you know, when I moved away from home and started a new call or new school, new town, new city, new name. I tried. It didn't work. It's This is me. That name thing was pretty funny because I don't remember if I've said this before, but when I met her, we actually met at work, which is interesting that we now run a business together, and I definitely stuck with you. You know, this. we worked well together. Why not work and live and, and, and all the things together? I don't think we got <laughs> anything accomplished when we were working together back then at the nursery, but I met her, and she said her name was Rachel. I did. It was at and the everybody, time. Everybody, everybody there knew you as Rachel. At that point in my life, I was Rachel. And I had been Rachel for like two and a half years. By also, then. Rachel had just gotten her hair color too. I, oh so man, was, I forgot about that. Yeah. And when I was, I, met, I was still, I was feeling, I was feeling myself. Man, I had a new name, new hair. Like I was, I was a new person. Once I actually met her family, we start, we, we started dating pretty much immediately, and we're essentially living together within just a couple of weeks of us knowing each other. And the funny thing was I actually met her family a few weeks after that, I think. I think we were, I mean, we'd been living together by mm-hmm. the time. It was the air show, I think, is when you met them for it, the first time. I mean, time. it was, yeah. but I'm trying to think of when. I think that air show was I think it was in May. But we've been together for a minute. Anyways, I go to meet her family and they kept calling her Chris. Or actually, I think it started with me. I think I said something about Rachel and everybody kind of looked at me weird. And... Then I, Which is weird saying, because I told them, like, hey, I go by Rachel at school. And, and then, I guess they just wouldn't believe me. 
And then everybody called you Chris, except for me. And I know at the time they were like, there's no way this is going to work out. They may have hoped. However, here we are. 15 years later. I don't know. But here we are, you being you. You are wife, mom, and business extraordinaire. I wear a lot of hats. Not today. Is that why your hair is always so crazy? I like my hair. Is that what it is? Or is it that you're pulling it out? I'm probably pulling it out. Like, I gotta, I gotta pull out all the gray hair. Anyone that lives with me and works with me all day, every day, probably loses some hair. A little. It's yes. fair to say. It's cool. Yes. I get it. But, you know, one of the cool things is I, I can say confidently that this business would not be where it is today without you. It's unquestionably so. I am good at what I do. However, I, everything that you do are things I couldn't do. And especially couldn't do them on the level that you do them while also doing other things. I'm not saying you can multitask, mm. but you... Not my strong suit. If you are on one thing, you really just dominate it. And there's you have so many cool, unique skill sets and stuff that I don't have. We grew up so vastly different. But the way that you grew up, I feel like really lends the biggest hand toward being a business owner. I figured I'd let you talk about that a little bit, but you grew up in kind of a unique way. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I mean, essentially it was, it was backwoods without the backwoods. I mean, it was country. It was, you know, we, we had a cattle farm, we had a garden, we had, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a big city. I, I mean, my population was 1300. And when I wasn't at my house tending to our farm, whatever, then I was at my grandparents' house dealing with the family farm because we also had a, an Angus farm there as well. So, like, we had, like, our, like, little 20 head of cattle here, and then we had, like, 120 head of cattle there. So, you know, it was, it was, a, lot of, it was a lot of growing up not the same that you did. As normal people? As normal people, yes. Okay, I actually think your way was actually cooler I know my grandparents at one point, they lived in Montgomery pretty much for the majority of my life up until 15, and they lived out there in the middle of nowhere. They didn't have cattle on their property. I think they had some somewhere else, but I'm not really sure what the deal was with that. I never really asked. I know we went to it a few times, but uh, I think they were more so just helping the neighbors, and I think they had gone in, but... It was the coolest thing to go down there and fish in their pond. Every time I went down there, we were hunting, and... I would never in my wildest dreams be barefoot outside now. Oh my gosh, weird. that's but how, that's like, how don't put there. shoes on me. I, I grew up barefoot. I yeah. grew up running the fields. I grew up, you know, it, it was almost expected of me to be outside. By the time I was out of school, once my homework was done, I was to be outside doing something. And then when the clouds were pink, then it was time to come back inside. See, you didn't have streetlights. You went no, by the cloud. No, I was in the country. We didn't have streetlights. There was no, like, be home by the street. No, it was the pink clouds. I've never heard anybody else say that. Are you not? No. No. No, we had streetlights. No, I we was. didn't have those. No. Okay. That's new to me. Yeah. I, you, you, know, you learn something every day. I mean, I was eight years old sitting on top of a, a cow while my dad steered it. No fear holding it down while its little legs were held with a belt because dad would take off his belt and tie the legs together. We didn't even have rope. We just used his belt. That's old school, man. Yeah. Well, how do you feel like, do you feel, I mean, I know you do, but the way that you were raised, I feel like really translates well into business now. How do you feel like for you that it helped you? I mean, I think it gave me that work ethic. You know, I, I've held a lot of different jobs and vast industries I've I've never just stuck with one thing I I feel like kind of like what we spoke yesterday about but it's not ever gonna be seen but like success is different to so many people and to me success is knowing as much as you can know as much information as all the the industry so growing up my dad was you know you got to get in business for yourself you you got to work for yourself one day and I'm like okay and I took that to heart, and I learned everything I could learn about everything I can learn about. And I think having that knowledge of the worth ethic, like, you you just got to get it done at the end of the day. Well, you're holding yourself accountable. Working, doing the cattle thing, because I know it was separate from where you live for mm-hmm. the majority of it, right? You were going back and forth. We were, yeah. So um, every summer, every day in the summer, I was always at my grandparents' house. 
Um, I mean, growing up, all my family lived there. So we were kind of by ourselves in Sardis, and then all the family lived out in Godston and Rainbow City. And so the what, 30 minute drive? 30 minute drive, least. yeah. So every, you know, every day, if not every other day, I was at my grandparents' house and, you know, riding the four wheelers, herding up the cattle, doing roundups, playing in the hay. Um, my grandparents had gardens as well, so I'd be helping them with their gardens or we'd be fishing. I wasn't allowed to hunt. I still wouldn't trust you with a gun. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing is like, I wasn't really, and it, I guess it wasn't that I wasn't allowed, but my dad didn't have any boys. We, it was just us girls and I, I guess he just never wanted us around guns. I don't know. I mean, we had gun safety. We knew about guns. I just, yeah, I never just went hunting. Thing. Yeah. Well, it's the thing about the way that you were raised in that sense, which I think to me, at least the first thing that stands out is you grew up with an urgency and a this has to be done whether or not you want oh, to do yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Like, you have to tend to the cattle, and you have to make sure that, because they were our food source. And if the cows weren't taken care of, if the garden wasn't tended to, then what do we have to eat? True. I mean, you could always go to the store. But you didn't have a lot of... No, because I grew up like I was poor, thinking that we were poor, even though my parents were secretly hiding... Because, again, they instilled that financial... Like, you have to count every penny you have, and you have to stretch this penny, and you have to make it last. And now knowing that they went and bought a condo with cash, I'm like, oh, I get it now. It makes sense. You hold on to every single penny, mm-hmm. and, and then you make a solid investment, but... I was I was listening to someone on the radio today. They were talking about that, and I thought that was the funniest thing. They were saying that they had pretty much been business owners majority of their life they had saved up everything they were driving cars that were almost 20 years old that same. hardly ran yep same and the difference i they got to that point where they retired they had more money than they knew what to do with i mean this this couple had millions of dollars and they were living essentially like they were doing paycheck to paycheck and they didn't even want to spend the money when they got to it because they were afraid they were so used to being like, no, you can't do this. And Mm -hmm. their accountant had to say, Hey, look, you're like 80, like 85. Uh, You might as well. It's time to spend some, it's time to live your life. (laughs) I don't want to be that. No, I I like to enjoy the experiences now. I don't want to wait until I'm 80 to travel and do things, which is something that we've tried to do a lot Mm -hmm. more lately. We've tried to, to do that. And it, it's tough with business. I know that when we first started this, we thought, oh man, we're gonna be able to do anything we want when we want. But when you book so far in advance, it is really difficult. And it's hard to you make really time. have to pay attention to that calendar and plan around it. And it's also extremely, extremely difficult to break loose from that feeling of having to have your phone with you constantly. And you have to respond back to clients and messages. And mm-hmm. you know, you're off for seven days, and you're not in your studio, or you're not at home working, and you're trying to do family time, but you can't. You can't turn the mind off. But again, even for you, though, I think that you grew up in a way where you it didn't matter if it's cold outside. It didn't matter if it's hot outside. It didn't matter if it's raining or if you were tired or whoever. Cattle had to be tended to. Mm-hmm. I know at one point they, you also were, they were breeding golden retrievers we, for a short yeah, time. Yeah, so right? um, maybe it was about three years in total that we did it, but we did raise golden retriever dogs. Um, we had two females and two males and, and we went with that for a little while. I don't really remember why we quit other than I think it was just too much to keep up with. We had like just other things going on, but I loved it. Oh, I'm sure I you lo- did. Golden Retrievers, man, they're like the best dogs. Dude, I do not need any more hair in the house. I have three females and a German Shepherd. I'm good. Well, we can, you no, know. No, no, we're maxed out. I'm just One letting day. you know. No. When I'm gone, and you have your cats. And my golden retriever. There you go. Done. Settled. <laughs> Next. So, growing up, though, in that area, I know you've said a, you know, a lot that you knew pretty early on that you didn't want to stay there. No, I didn't want that life. I um, I, I appreciated all the the skills the the morals I learned from it you know I again I got that hard working you know you, you got to get it done you can't cry about it type thing but the farm life was not what I envisioned for myself I was it, it was just too small for me and 
looking at myself, I find that really odd because I am such an introvert. I do like to just be in my bubble and nobody talk to me. Just give me a computer. Let me get my work done. Let me just not exist. But I could not stay there. Um, I still love country. I still love nature. I still love being outdoors. I realized that I love a city. I love the people. I love the hustle and bustle. So I guess I'm, I'm just like that weird in between, but that it was just too small of a town. It was, everybody knew everybody, everybody's in a, everybody's business, but then I come to Tuscaloosa and it's exactly the same. This is the strangest place I've ever lived. I mean, and it, to be fair, I've only lived here, but. But this has, you know, 100,000 more people than what I grew up with, but. Everybody still knows everybody in their Everybody business. is still in everybody's business. Maybe it's an Alabama thing. I don't know. I don't know, but I just, you know. I love the outdoors, but I love having neighbors. Eh. We got we got good neighbors. We have good we're, neighbors. We're very we're actually very lucky where we are mm-hmm. because we all we have we're in a cul de sac in our neighborhood and it, we really do have the best neighbors. Mm-hmm. I actually I was always afraid to move in to a neighborhood because of I just didn't want to have those noisy, loud neighbors that were. I think Always we're the noisy, music. loud neighbors. Yeah, and and that's me because <laughs> I play guitar and I I bought uh, a vintage Super Reverb amp and it's uh, it's got four ten inch speakers in it. And it sounds beautiful. It sounds great. It sounds amazing. Which is what the neighbors across from us in the cul de sac tell me when they're inside their house and I'm playing inside our house. Or if they're out of town and their ring camera goes off and you can yeah. hear the audio. <laughs> so it's a whole thing. I definitely am the loudest one. However, I do have two musicians in the cul-de-sac with me, so it's all good. But but growing up, I didn't have neighbors. I, you know, we had down the street people, but if I needed a cup of sugar, I had to go to the store. And the store wasn't right down the road either. The store was, you know... Tw- it's a piggly wiggly. It's not down home down the street by any means. You still got to drive out to it. Not exactly Publix. No, we didn't this. have a Publix. Um, we we did not have a Win Dixie. Wow. Piggly wiggly was was it? So, at what point were you looking to like? I know that obviously when you graduated, you moved away and came mm-hmm. here. At what point was that the final decision? Like, okay, I'm moving when I graduate, not I'm taking some time. You just. No, actually, if I would have had it my way in a perfect world, um, I probably would not have gone to college first year. I really wanted a gap year. I really wanted to be on my own, find myself. Cause I, mean, I was always, you know, I, I was always this person. I was always doing this, doing that. I was always doing things for other people and I never, did for myself I mean um I mean I did orchestra for me because it was something I enjoyed but it was more or less like hey you need to be in an extracurricular hey you need to do this well I played softball for a little while I got you know I just at some point I just wasn't good anymore and I wasn't going to keep struggling so I quit that and then like I needed to be in something because something looks good on college resumes I actually as you're sitting here talking I'm looking at you and I'm thinking about it and I'm I've our youngest daughter mm-hmm. is, is you. Yes. And we know this. <laughs> yes. She is 1,000% you. And I was thinking about the conversation that we had with her yesterday. We were mm-hmm. talking about her drum lessons. And I'm like, no, you need to be in something. You know? And I, I stopped myself a second ago thinking I was. it hit me that it's because both of you are so ridiculously smart that it's like, no, you are capable. You need to be doing something because I think you can figure it out. And I get that that was probably the case for both of you. But at some point, you up, figure it out and then you get bored. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. And you don't want to keep doing it anymore. You want to go to the next task. Because your skill set's so, so different than mine. Because I'm not, I'm not an intellectual person. I'm not a sit down and read. I'm not a, I, I, I enjoy learning now. I mean, I failed my way through everything in which seems like it doesn't make any sense. No, but I mean, I was all a student. You're such a suck up. That is, you are your freaking child. I swear. It, it, it really is. And it's, it's so funny because our kids are exactly us in almost every way that I have come across thus far. My mm-hmm. old, our oldest, she is me in every way. But she gets and good grades. She does. I never did, but it, it was, if I tried, I could, mm-hmm. but I just didn't try. It was just, I, a lot of it was laziness. I actually caught her the other night. She had actually fallen asleep studying 
And I thought it was like, well, you're not my child. She's but very much of a, if she still has homework, she's going to stay up late and get it she, done. She learns that from you for sure. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about the extracurricular stuff and you, you, you making that comment. I realized that so much of that, I don't even know if it has to do with a college resume in your circumstance or if it's just, I know that your parents realize that you are I needed to smart. be doing something. You, I needed. You have to be occupied. Mm-hmm. You, you really, you're almost, without, without comparing you and saying, hey, you're like our dog. You really are like chief. I, so I need like to be. Our German yeah. shepherd has to be occupied. He has to have something that he can do. Otherwise, he starts losing his mind. Mm-hmm. That's you. Mm-hmm. I mean, from a young age, I I did softball from like five years old all the way up to sixth grade or maybe fifth grade. I took piano lessons. I would I did one year on the basketball team. I'm not a basketball player. You I, and I, sports really. I, I no, I mean I was good at softball until I just got bigger, and then I guess the depth perception. I That's couldn't I couldn't hit huge. the ball anymore. And yeah. sports don't yeah. mix. Let's yeah. just be real. I enjoyed it, though. Um, <laughs> I did also gymnastics for a little while. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, you pose and do all the stuff here. It seems to fit you. I mean, another perfect world metaverse. I would have been a ballerina. But um, once I found band and orchestra and wind ensemble and then marching band and then concert band. And then, you know, it's like, oh, are you going to go join the million dollar band when you get to college? No, because I did that forever. I need to find a new me. So, I don't know. It was just, I guess along the way, I was always trying so many new things just to find out who I was as a person. And, but because my parents were paying for my college, they did not want me to take a year off. They thought if I took a year off, I would never go to school, which they True. probably would have been correct. I probably never would have because I really did not go. I, I had a lot of conversations with them. I do not want to go to college right now. I, I really want to just be me and find out who I am. And that wasn't going to happen. You know, it's interesting, too, because I know when I met you, you were in college. I think that you were ending sophomore, mm-hmm. getting into junior, somewhere around in that in that time frame, maybe. I'm not sure. But, I, was, I was junior year. Okay. So, one thing is, at that point, I know that you were struggling a little bit with grades, but you were also in stuff you didn't want to do. Yeah. But I almost wonder if that, because I know that that was probably the first time in your life you had ever really struggled. Mm-hmm. The The classes I did not want to take were the classes that I struggled the most in. Which is interesting because it's like, hey, I don't want to go. And then you kind of get put into that situation. And then it's like, I'm not happy. I'm not doing something mm-hmm. I want to do. I'm definitely the person that if you put me on a task that I don't agree with, I don't see sense in doing it, I think it's completely useless, I will fail every time. Because mm-hmm. I'm not... Mm-hmm. Not putting that 100% in. Mm. It's funny how that works. I know, right? Mm. I'm going to remember this conversation. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to put this if in you, the Instagram it's, clip it's, for look, you. Look, it's, it's, it's like accounting. I, I passed I the accounting class with a C minus. It's not what I want to do. I will get it done. You it are, ain't going to look pretty though. You are so bad at accounting that our accountants hate us. This is true. Like it's that bad. This is true. And to be fair, I probably could just take that over, but it's, 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 it's I, I have it so screwed up. At this point, you I don't, don't want to look at it. <laughs> I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. It's we're probably the last person every year that they do now. They're like, yeah. I just don't want to do this. They're like, I haven't drank enough to do this. I no, don't. Yeah, but that's okay. We have our strengths and our weaknesses, and you know, QuickBooks is go. not my strength. So when you were moving away, and you were moving here to mm-hmm. Tuscaloosa, what was the hardest part of moving away? Because I know that it's great. That I couldn't get out fast enough. I, I know, I know that that's that's a thing. I like, that was, was the there... hardest thing is is come graduation day, I was done. <laughs> I was like packed up, ready to go, but I had to wait till August. So I spent a summer um, working at a bank, just saving up a little extra cash, and I mean, it, it really was the biggest struggle. Was I was ready to go, and I had to wait. So all summer long, you're just sitting there anticipating. Mm-hmm. I had, I, so I had something to look forward to that summer. I did go to New York City. Um, but after I got back from New York City, I'm like, okay, let's go to college. Oh. Yeah. 
So when you came here, though, mm -hmm. that was you just essentially by yourself. I was. I was completely alone. I did not know anybody. There was one other kid from my class that came here, but he was on a different side of campus. So we never saw each other. I didn't have any family. I didn't have any other friends. I was really, and but that's what I wanted. I wanted myself in a situation where I was forced to meet new people and find myself. So... I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know what I liked to do. I didn't, because I mean, I wasn't the popular kid, so I didn't really get asked out on a lot of events or things. So I had no idea what I liked. What was that like, though, going from where you were to here? It was hard at first um, because I was such an introvert and I, I wasn't a popular person. I did not know how to make friends. I, I mean, I, I was still very much of a, you know, if you sit beside me in class, I might talk to you, but otherwise I'm just going to keep to myself. Um, but I put myself out there. I, I joined a few clubs. Um, I got on an honor society for my grades. Of course you did. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, but I, you know, my, I, I got in a dorm, and the dorm I was in was Freedman. <laughs> As those of you who are laughing to yourselves because it does not exist anymore, they have bulldozed the building down. It was a shitty building. It was falling apart. The oven was, like, you couldn't even bake a, a, a cookie sheet of cookies in there. Like, the oven was the tiniest oven in that little kitchen. Nobody used it. Honestly, I'd be afraid to turn on the power in that place. Mm -hmm. It was so bad. It was, it was bad. Um, I, unfortunately, had a, a roommate my first semester, halfway through the first semester, that we did not see eye to eye because her boyfriend was basically living in our room. Just the size of this table. The room was half the size of, like, from there to there. Um, but, I mean, you know, two twin beds are literally this far apart from each other. And I got her and him in this bed and me by myself. And I'm not that's comfortable. A weird, yeah, it's a, a very a, weird situation. So acceptable. Yeah, so I was able to move out of my room and move in with the only other girl who had a single bed at the time. She took me in. Sweet Ebony. Still friends to this day. Love her to death. Um but it really was just like I understood that if I wanted to make it, I had to make friends. I had to to just put myself out there, and and I was okay with that decision. I mean, I was nervous. I was scared, of course, but I knew if I wanted to make a name for myself, I had to do the things, so. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, there really is no way around that when you are put in that kind of situation because mm -hmm. you have to figure that out because mm -hmm. you didn't have anybody here at all, at least for that first year mm -mm. or so. So any – for. I I think that's something that also gives you another advantage in, to doing what we're doing in this business and eventually leading up to all, all of these small things that you've done and experienced led up to being able to become a business owner mm -hmm. where you went full-time in something like this. So. I've really been able to pick from those experiences and apply them to today. Like, I know I had to network and get my name out there, so I... I went to all the, the dorm events, so like there was a Halloween party, there was a pool table in the basement, so you know, most whatever days, like if I knew that they were having um, poker night, I would make sure that I would, you know, at least pop in and say hi, so my face was out there, I uh, did the events on campus, I... Um, and you went through several different jobs, too. I, uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I did uh, referee, so uh, soccer refereeing, I was on the yearbook, um... I mean, I would I would do as many things as I could just to meet as many different people. And, I mean, I didn't – it wasn't so much me trying to find a best friend. It was just me trying to make friends and make connections. So right. I've been able to take that to this. Um, all my business classes, thankfully, they weren't the best at telling me how to run a business. They really did not prepare me to how to run a business, but they gave me enough of a, a baseline starting point. They gave me that foundation. Like I said, I made a C- in accounting – but I know what a balance sheet is, so. The fact that you're a straight-A student and you got a C-minus in something. It's because it was math, and math is not my strong suit. But you didn't get a C-minus in math. You got a C-minus in accounting. Uh, okay, so that story is when I was here for orientation, and I had to take the math test to see what math I, would, I felt. I missed it by, like, one point, so I had to take a remedial math class. So, yeah, I made straight A's in my math class. That's okay. I know. So, look, you didn't – I think you did, what, 098 yeah. or, like, 101? Okay. That was 98. Okay. Well, I know somebody that did 90, so – At least and, did better and, than that. And I – I remember she showed me some of the stuff she was doing, and it was legitimately starting at, like, 
four plus five equals. Yes. It's like, Nine. are you really <laughs> this bad? Like, yes, is it... I am. So, but you know what? I learned how to use a calculator. Which is hilarious because everybody said that we would never have calculators in our pocket all the time. Bet. Now they're on our watches. That's co- Oh, that's true. It's very true. I don't <laughs> use it too tiny. My fingers, yeah, no. But <laughs> it is, it's still there if you need it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you started working, you went to several different jobs mm-hmm. that eventually led up to us meeting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so before you and I met, um, I, I worked in a bank. I was a referee. I worked in yearbook, taking pictures. Literally none of these are connected. This is the randomish group of jobs I've ever seen. I worked at Smoothie King. Were you just trying to hit every field possible? Yes. No pun intended. I about like the soccer to be well rounded. Okay. Um So this was intentional? Are we gonna are we gonna stick with that? I really was not. I just needed money. <laughs> um I worked at ATT. I worked at Well that was after we met though. That was after we met, you're correct. I worked at the nursery. Mm-hmm. I guess that was it between Smoothie King and the little jobs at UA and then um, the nursery. Which is really odd is how you found the nursery because all the jobs you worked were right around campus. They and the nursery were, was so far away in the middle of nowhere. How did you come across that? Um, I knew a girl who said that they needed help. Okay. So. Yeah, I was always curious about that because I don't know if I ever really figured out how the hell you ended up over there. I somehow but. ran into Paige, and Paige is like, oh, well, we're actually looking. And I'm like, well, I'm looking too, so let's make it happen. Nice. So. Yeah, they had just moved. Uh, it had been, so I worked there on and off for several years. That was my first job right outside, uh, right in high school that, I say it was my first job. I actually worked at Winn-Dixie, and then left Winn-Dixie, started working at the nursery in the summertime, which was by the way, the worst time ever to take an outside job. I have done this three times in my life. All three times I thought I was going to die. But that first job at the old location on Rice Valley Road, where it had been forever, they were demoing. So when you started working there, you got the, the fancy retail job where you got to have pretty clean clothes every day. And I mean, they started clean, but you know me. I like to make a mess. So yeah, watering but, plants and everything. Oh, tough watering plants. We were tearing down the chimney of an old house that they moved. I didn't know the Palm House had a chimney in it. Yes. And it was bigger than this table. Where was the chimney in the Palm House? I don't know. In relation, it was like in the middle. (laughs) I I, I guess. I don't know. It was in there. I just remember walking in. I was like, why is the floor different? Oh, because they broke the house in half to move it. (laughs) Yeah. So this house was, gosh, I mean, it was, I don't know, maybe 100 years old. or or They said they used to have like weddings and stuff in there. I don't know. It was. It was old, and it was this ratty house with this gigantic brick fireplace right in, in the middle. And it may not have been, it was, may have been more, to, you know, centered to one side. But the job that we had was demoing the entire old nursery, taking down all the old stuff, and helping get things ready to rebuild. Because mm-hmm. it was a new owner, he was coming in with this massive vision, and he did a phenomenal job. But they took this house, completely gutted the entire si- the entire house, and then recovered the outside. I had, I mean, there were, they literally, the entire thing was completely different. I, mean, I just not, thought not it was so weird to, to move a house. I never understood why they didn't just tear it down and rebuild because they could have built something nicer. Right. Mm-hmm. But they did. They, they tore everything out of it, completely gutted, rebuilt everything inside which is weird out. that they rebuilt because like where the offices and admin part of the building was nice yeah but the employee break room yeah it's awful <laughs> the trailer that was like a female horrible. trailer horrible but the so when they rebuilt that they then moved it to a new location on the same property and then eventually moved it to another location several miles down the road and i'm like you realize all the money y'all have spent going through this you could have just rebuilt but to be fair, it probably was cheaper to do that, and the amount of money that was going into that place to make it what it was, mm-hmm. you know, they're probably cutting costs, and it was fine. But that was the job that I had when I was there for the summer. And we, I mean, we tore down the chimney in just like a couple of days, but it was just us, it was me, a couple of other 16-year-old guys, that rich kids that did not, Young had never done lads. that kind of work, and then a bunch of drug addicts. One of them's dead, the other's in prison. And 
That great was, company. That was that was her awesome summer. Yeah. But I bet I worked, you learned a lot. Oh god, you have no idea. <laughs> but we I went back and forth from there for several years. Uh, took a lot of different positions there, and then eventually I was there. I think uh, my I just graduated high school. I was working working full time, and I got pissed off one day. The manager was awesome person. She was great to work with. She was awesome manager for me, but I just had enough one day of being in that place and pretty much walked out and quit. I was like, I'm never coming back to here. But I was a few months later. I was working at Target. She randomly messaged me out of the blue and was like, Hey. I need you to come back because we were rolling into there. They had moved locations. They were rolling into the spring. And I was like, well, I'll come hang out. Came hang, came and hung out, offered me a really good position. And then that's where I met you. Mm-hmm. It is. And we worked together for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Up until June, I think it was. I don't know. So... We met pretty much immediately, started dating, moved in together. Mm -hmm. I got an apartment. Headed off, as, you know, one might say. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know who that person is. but We headed uh, off. She, uh, so I got an apartment. We were, I was living with my grandmother at the time. And I had, I had moved out when I was, the day after I graduated high school, moved out. Moved into a house. It was a whole shit show of a situation, but... Everything went wrong. I totaled my truck. I mean, literally everything went wrong immediately following moving out. It was an awful year. I was going to go into paramedic school, decided to, that, that didn't work out. I won't say decided. It, <laughs> it, it, just it didn't was work. decided for me that it, did, that it, it wasn't going to work out. Moved in with my grandmother, was living there for a few months, fell on this stray, and uh, mm. what was. I at least asked. <laughs> no, 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 you were good. It was. It was the first night that you stayed over there. Mm -hmm. It turned into a whole other shit show because apparently my 90-year-old grandmother did not appreciate Rachel's walk of shame. You know, I was not... How was I supposed to know it was going to snow? Yeah, I mean, it was was hilarious because it was March. It's March. It's not supposed to snow in March. So, yes, I leave my car parked outside of the house, and it snows. So you wake up the next day, and you're like, oh, well, there's snow on top of the car, so clearly it was here all night long. And she was sharp. My grandma, she knew she was. She mm. saw she saw that car saw, and looked at Rachel walking down those stairs, and I got. A she sh- hated me. She didn't hate you, but she hated me. I got a stern talking to when you left. Stern. It was and uh, and so at that point I had to immediately. I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. This is back before this town was covered in apartments. You didn't have options. Mm-hmm. It was they were rough there places. Were no, yeah, and I found an apartment that just so happened to be. I mean, we're talking a quarter mile from Rachel's apartment. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was complete walking distance. And it just so happened that it was the place that I wanted to be. We, it, it really didn't have anything to do with her being located there. It was just this was the only decent apartment. Mm-hmm. I didn't like where hers was. And so they did stuff by rooms, and where I was, you could have the still get place, the whole place. Yeah. And so, Because mine was much more of a college right. apartment. So we moved in together, uh, and I never – Got to stay a night there by myself. It was... Well, you know, I helped you move in, and I'm obviously tired, so I'm going to (laughs) stay. And then by night three, I'm like, so I should just leave a toothbrush here. And you're like, yeah, okay. (laughs) And 15 years later. Clothes (laughs) appeared, and then all the things, and then... But it was great. Uh, uh, You did all the cooking, because I couldn't do that. I did. I did a lot of cooking. That's when I started gaining weight. Yeah, all that banana pudding, and... (laughs) It's so terrible. But we, you, at that point, you, so I ended up getting laid off from the job at the nursery. And then I got really angry and I quit. And then. Not my best moment. We struggled hard for months. Like when I talk about being poor, y'all like we were poor. Because I wasn't working and I was still in college and I didn't have time to get a job. And I think you were picking up odds and end jobs. Anything I could do. I I had done uh, pressure washing for years, just sort of on and off as a business and. But it was hard because social media really wasn't a thing Mm-mm. back then. Like the, you, you I mean, you really had adver- Facebook, but Instagram wasn't a thing. But you weren't really advertising businesses on there. Mm-mm. It was still just, this is, we're talking 2009. I'm, I'm over here complaining about my computer science class on Facebook. Right. And so <laughs> that was back when it was still 
Rachel is and then dot, dot, whatever dot. your status yeah. was. And so you were, it, w- it was tough to find work and, and, and to do anything. And it was also right at the uh, crash, you know, everything, the housing market crash in 08. And I don't think that we were aware of how bad things really were, but Mm-mm. you were, you were still finishing up school. Mm-hmm. What was that like trying to finish up school, but stressing, you know, over money and not working? I just wanted a job. You know, I mean, I, going into senior year, I'm like, well, this is it. I got to start applying. But, you know, it's do you apply anywhere and then pack up everything and move again? Or do you apply local to Tuscaloosa? And Well, jobs were extraordinarily hard to come mm-hmm. by, even if, I mean, especially if you were trying to find something. Because mm-hmm. for you, you went to school for marketing. Yeah. And, and I think a part of me really wanted to work at UA because I knew, like, listening to your family talk about UA and how great it is to work there and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, this is where I got to work. And what better way to get a job straight out of the college that you're about to graduate from is to go straight back into the college for a job. But they wouldn't hire me. Um, I I don't remember where all I applied to. But by the time I graduated, I had applied to AT&T because at that point I needed something um, and I think we had a friend connection or, mm-hmm. or with the Martha, manager. I believe, mm-hmm. Martha and Jamin, actually. Both. Well, Martha from your mom put us in connection with Jamin. But um, basically the only reasons why I was even hired was that they could – I could work any time because I didn't have classes anymore. I didn't have a school schedule that I had to work around. At the time, it was a decent place to work. Like you were making okay money mm-hmm. pretty was, much right yeah. off the bat. Yeah. But – I was not a salesperson, but I made it work. But that was okay early on. Mm-hmm. But I know that that shifted. I know management and ownership changed, and Mm -hmm. it turned into an absolute nightmare, and then it got really miserable. Yeah. Um, Towards the end, they had completely changed my hours. I was no longer – because, I mean, I had set hours, set off days, set everything, and then it was – I was on some weird shift schedule, and every two weeks was never the same. I never knew what my hours were going to be. And then the worst part of it is I now had a quota I had to meet, and if I didn't meet it, I was going to be fired. And there's nothing like, you know, being told, hey, if you don't sell three of these, you're gone. <laughs> sell these three things that absolutely no one wants. I mean, nobody wanted, you know, home security through AT&T. You get home security through the home security people. Right. So, like, how am I supposed I'm, I'm selling cell phones and home security and internet and TV services. Like, it's... It was too much. And everybody hates you because AT&T had yeah, nothing Yeah, I problems. mean, you know, you, you have a problem on your bill and you come in and you yell at me for it. And I didn't talk up your phone line until 2 in the morning. I'm not your teenage son, so. But I think so much of that, again, that job that you, you know, you did that for what, six? Six years. Six years. Uh, that gave you the confidence in selling. That gave you. All the customer service. More customer service Mm -hmm. and dealing with those massive issues and learning how to kind of keep your cool and Mm -hmm. saying, okay, you know, I, so many people that, that I know personally, if they were in a situation where they have a customer yelling at them, they're going to yell back and it's going to turn sideways. Yeah. I I can easily, like, if you start coming at me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to let you yell, like get it out. Right. And then let's fix it. Right. Well, at some point, I don't remember when. You picked up a new career in the middle of that, but you were still there because mm-hmm. you still did both at the same time. Yeah, so maternity leave with the firstborn. Um, I don't remember how it came around other than I think you just mentioned it and I just ran with the idea, but I started doing real estate. I took all the classes on maternity leave because you could do them all online, pass the test and everything, and then I got in with a brokerage, and I did real estate for maybe two years. I think it was two-ish. Um I mean, I loved it, but again, you know, just like kind of what we were talking about earlier, it's, it was one of those things that just wasn't for me at that time. It didn't bring me the, the passion and, you know, like it was great. I had fun. I loved it. I sold houses. I was successful, but I wasn't all I could be. I, you know, I really didn't push myself as much as I could have pushed myself. I know that was definitely a conversation we had a lot of Mm -hmm. me saying, Hey, people really like you. Mm -hmm. If you just put yourself out there a little bit more, do do I walk away from a steady at that time, a steady paying job with AT&T to do real estate, which is very much of a, you never know what's going to happen. But again, I think that's also why I was, I was so okay with leaving UA to do this is I had, you know, already had some of those conversations with myself. Can I do this if it came down to it? It just, with AT&T, I just never walked away from that. I walked away from the real estate. Well, no, technically, because by then I got that job offer at UA 
and I couldn't do, mm-hmm. I couldn't show houses with the UA schedule. You were on the back end of the real estate thing. You were kind of already at that point of saying, hey, I think, I think this it's isn't just for not me. really mm-hmm. something that I love. So, because the only way the real estate worked out was because my hours at AT&T were so crappy. I could show houses on my lunch break. Right. <laughs> and that worked out for you for a while. It did. But I remember when the UA job Th- when, when that sort of came up, we started talking about this and saying, okay, it was time to get something more steady. And, mm-hmm. and you had really wanted to work out there. That I think ultimately. Mm-hmm. That was my, that was a dream goal I had. It was, it really was like, I wanted to be at UA because I knew at that time it was job security. It was retirement. It was, you know, I, it had everything that I needed to make sure that I could provide for my family. I think this is a good point to kind of pause and interject this too, but we had no conversations prior to this business about trying to be business owners and do something like this. Mm -hmm. We were really just trying to play it safe. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with trying to play it safe, but that was, we just wanted some type of security. The entire time that we've been together, we've both bounced around from different things, different careers, different fields, and had no money for up until probably I mean, the last we four were years. paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, I, well, I say I said the last four years. Up up until I got a job with the police department, that was the first time that we finally started to actually be comfortable, mm-hmm. and you could comfortably know at the end of the month that you were going to have enough money to be fine and, and do mm-hmm. whatever. We actually were able to put money into savings. It was. I remember the first time where we could just say, "Okay, we got." Whatever left over, yeah, you want to go somewhere and get whatever, go do what, go mm-hmm. do whatever. That was probably, I would say, ten years at least. I would say close to ten years into our marriage, maybe maybe nine. Yeah. And it was so hard because once we had the kids and we were both working and they both had daycare, and when you have a mortgage, plus you have two kids in daycare, that's another mortgage. Like all of our money was going yep. car payments, all the things. Mm-hmm. But we were barely. We were barely getting by. I mean, it was, we struggled with absolutely no money to the point of being, I've said it before, I'll say it a million times, jealous of people at the gas station who could just go in and have go get a drink. whatever they wanted. And I'm, I'm not even that person ever. But we really were every month, how are we going to make it through this month? Mm-hmm. How are we going to get through? What's going to happen? And that just goes back to my childhood. Like, you know, we were penny pinching and I knew how to do that because I grew up like you stretch your penny as far as you can. And you definitely helped get us through that for sure. Because that was, you know, you always made really good decisions when it came to that. Uh, whereas I don't, we just bought just a little bougie. You're, we, you're just, you're just a little. I mean, we did extra. just, I did just buy a six and a half foot Martian. That's standing in my... But we both agreed. We both know it's irresponsible. However, you got to live the experiences now. To. You can't wait until you're 85 to... He had to come home with us. But... Did he? He did. did he, I think did he's he, happy. Did I he, think he's happy there. Did he tell you that? He looks a little surprised. Ah. But <laughs> I think it's good. So for those that don't know what we're talking about, uh, Mars Attacks, we were at Spirit Halloween. And for whatever reason this year, Mars Attacks has become something that they started getting a lot of... That and the killer clown. Yeah, they've got a lot of signature things from that. And I guess they just got rights to be able to use their stuff. So they have a six foot, six and a half foot. Yeah, don't forget that half. (laughs) Six and a half foot. And it's super awesome animatronic thing that I don't need, but I bought it. But back to the thing. I appreciate you, by the way. Yeah, I mean, you know, we pinched the pennies so we could buy the stuff. We did say, we did say. Yeah, we did say going into this, this is like a super irresponsible thing, and I'm okay, because we've never done that. Where but we, we had a coupon. Said, we did, 20% off. See, you're welcome. And the lady, I, I saved you money. Well, technically, the lady at the counter did, because she let me use her coupon. I still have hers. It's the same. It was the same percentage. I know. You're welcome. But I, I can use it again, which means we could buy another one. Uh, I think it expired today or tomorrow. Tomorrow, so okay. we got time. <laughs> there's no. another location. No, there's not. We got the only one. No. But you were... So t- you did the AT and T thing, we, mm. and then okay. So when we were talking about with the businesses and stuff, we I just wanted I was trying to work for the police department and the university police department, which is where I worked. Uh, I was out there for about seven years, and that was a goal for a long time. Where a lot of people asked, you know, why that place specifically, and for me, I was at the university. 
I knew Rachel was eventually going to try to come out to the university and work there. Mm -hmm. We were looking for something just stable and secure. Just anything I can get my foot in the door. Benefits, all the things. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to college. And for me, I always thought that just having something stable with benefits and insurance was going to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. I really had no dreams and aspirations of anything else. I've always kind of had that that entrepreneur bug, that 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 drive. But at the same time, you're talking about coming out of 2008 – all the way through and just seeing that, that crash and, and seeing all these things happening, mm -hmm. you, you just want security. And I get that for a lot of people, but we, UA paid the best at the time. They had so many more benefits to working there. You had holidays mm -hmm. and, and, you know, double time and a half for working a you know, holidays and all this great sounding things that we thought that we really wanted. And then you, I, I've been out there for several years at that point by the time you came in. Mm -hmm. I think I had f five years at the university by the time you made your way there. Yeah. And so how did that job come about? Um, I really don't even remember other than, I mean, I was every day on that job site applying for everything under the sun. I mean, I literally applied for hundreds of jobs out there. I don't know what about this one that it finally clicked. Other than I had already had so many past experiences and I was able to reflect that on my resume. I'm like, hey, uh, the job was a career advisor for those who are curious. Um, but I was able to translate a lot of that on my resume. I'm like, hey, I can speak to all these industries and I can help you, you know, figure out your career path based on all of my experiences. And um, I, I had a really good presentation for my interview. I mean, I PowerPoint the whole nine yards. Um, but it was, it was a really nice and happy transition. I was happy. I was so, I, I mean, I remember when they called me and told me I got the job. I was like, I, when you want me, I can come tomorrow. And they're like, no, no, we're, HR isn't ready for you yet. And I'm like, well, I'm ready. Let's go. So, that was me. I did yeah. the same thing. I, I, I turned around and, and I told my manager at the time, I was very unhappy with my job. Oh, they knew. Yeah. Very unhappy with my job. And so, I mean, I, I walked back in and I was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and put in my two weeks notice because I just got a new job. So I was out of town at training when you called. And I remember the, just that feeling at that point where I thought we've made it. Oh, we did. We're, I mean, we're we were, we're yeah. Like, all the stress, everything was starting to melt away because we were both solid out there. We, Like, I mean, I with that position, I had job security. I had job advancement. I, you know, there was nowhere else to go but up from there. And you worked out there for several years. Four and a half, position. yeah. Worked your way up. Mm -hmm. had a, I switched had positions. Own. I was able to get a salary increase. I even went back to school and got a master's while I was out there um, because they paid for it, so why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it's, I, I was able, if I would have stayed there, you know, within another five to 10 years, I could have had a director position. Yeah. I'm confident of that like, mm -hmm. you're so smart and, and you did so well in that job that I definitely felt like it was a good position for you mm -hmm. had we played it safe. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, this business sort of just started to take place. And I know that we talked about how this sort of came about early on, I think on our first episode mm -hmm. that we did. But just a quick refresh was we were just not spending time together. We were working so much. Both of us were always just passing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on evening shift at the time. And Tuesday, Wednesday off days, Rachel's working, you know, regular nine to five hours. I was eight to five. Eight to five or yeah. whatever your hour. Yeah. And – weekends off and I didn't see weekends off ever and we just started doing kind of photography together as a way to spend time together I had mm -hmm. no idea what I was doing Rachel was doing it a little bit at the time and eventually we tried out boudoir there's a lot of things that kind of happened in in between there but we mm -hmm. sort of tried this out and failed at it a couple of times and then and it was just stuff that we were trying just at home mm -hmm. but we once you figured out the light once we figured out the posing once we you know had people to practice on that it wasn't, well, it wasn't just even, me it was just but to back up it was that time when the the second time that we had shot this again I had no intention to ever do this with another person it was just hey I want to take photos of you like this I think it's really cool and I remembered 
you were always the most shy, just lacking confidence. You never really put yourself out there kind of person. You knew how to, you know, do I knew things how to network sense, but, because I had to, but never because I wanted right. to. And just the way you dressed and carried yourself, I always noticed that there was just a major lack of confidence there. And I remember the very first time that she saw the back of the camera and was like, oh, my gosh. And and that was really what set that in motion mm-hmm. immediately was that feeling. Of, and I talk about kind of what that was like for you in that moment to see something that you had never seen. You've been this person. I didn't know I could look that way. You, you, you're this small town, ultra, ultra conservative, mm-hmm. raised ultra conservative person. Yeah. I mean, never, I was never allowed to wear a crop top. I was never allowed to wear shorts that were too short. You know, I, I had a skirt that was just like half an inch too short and I got in so much trouble for that thing. So it's, you know, I was not allowed to do a lot of things. I, I I mean, I had my friends, but I didn't stay out till 10 o'clock every night. You know, I'm, when I came back home freshman year from college, I still had a curfew. You've always been a rule <laughs> follower. Since I've known and, and I guess that's, you know, growing up, I was very much of a, a people pleaser. It's you asked me what needed done and I got it done. You know, it, there was no if and or buts about it. There was no talking back. There was no whatever. It's this is the task and this is you do it and you get it done. You've always done a great job of that. But but definitely... now I have seen how being a people pleaser my entire life really put me in a corner and put me in the shadows. And, and it did not give me the time to focus on myself. I was so focused on making everybody else happy. I never did anything for myself. And then once you finally did that, oh my gosh. it really changed the course of everything mm-hmm. that we've done since then. It has. And I remember, I just remember showing you the back of the camera and just, you were like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I mean, these are not even good images because I was a terrible photographer. Absolutely horrendous. But it was just. But I could see the potential. She, she could see herself in a way that she had never seen mm-hmm. it. And that changed so much. And then I know, you know, we. I brought it to you. I said, okay, what if we do this? And you were like. I started laughing. Yeah. Like, like you are crazy. You are insane. Nobody will do this. We're going to lose all of our friends. We're going to, our family's going to disown us. They're going to, they're, everybody's going to hate us. And that was when I knew, okay, we're going to do this. And so we pushed. You were very confident and I was not so much. I knew the, the, the. The things about us are what what makes this work is Rachel, you are so highly intelligent, so book smart. You can learn anything. You can fix anything and do anything. But the people skills and the social side of that's never been a strong suit of yours. And you're not good at reading people, mm-hmm. not understanding some of those social dynamics and understanding I'm very socially awkward. or seeing that need for stuff. But if I put you in a task in a certain spot, there's nobody like I would like, I would literally put you up against any person to say, I promise you she's going to get this and get it faster and better. And I I see things in a very binary ones and zeros or black and white, you know, there's, there's always a yes or no, there's never a gray area, but when you and people and you're like, Hey, this could be something. I'm like, no, you're like, yeah, hang on, but there's something here. Yeah. I'm the exact opposite. And just the way that we were raised in general, like, I was raised here in the city. I spent the vast majority of my childhood growing up in a bar around grown-ass adults that were anywhere between 30 years old and 80 years old in the Moose Lodge. And this, All those life lessons, yeah, man. Yeah, all of, it's like the Moose Family Center, and it was a, it's just a bar. It's just a private bar. And so I was there almost every day for from probably six years old to 14 or 13, somewhere around in that, in that range. And so for me, I was not, you know, working with cattle or anything that had to be done. Everything that I had was basically, it can get done or it cannot. But the one thing that I did have is to be around people consistently. You know, mm-hmm. you're forced into awkward conversations with some of these people that you have no idea what to say and everybody's talking to you because you're a little kid. And all of those things are things that I paid attention to. And then learning that dynamic that was what I was forced into doing. Mm-hmm. And so for me, that's the one thing that I'm the best at is with the people and understanding and seeing and reading You knew that. how to make the idea an right. actual But thing. I have to have you to balance that because I can't do any of those things. But it's like you don't really do any of these things. And so we just, it works, which Smushed is funny. It together. Right. 
But when we started talking about that early on, you were really hesitant, but you were also putting yourself out there and really, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to. Like, if this is going to happen, all in, let's go, let's make it happen. But I was very hesitant. And talk a little bit about that feeling once this finally started going and took off and then that struggle you had of being that rule follower with that steady job and all that stuff. Was there a struggle to say, okay, we can leave and we can go all in on this or? I don't think there was so much of a struggle because again, back to the whole real estate and at and I knew I could have been a good realtor had I put a hundred percent into it, but the passion wasn't there. It just, something was missing, you know? So it's like, I'm not ready to walk away from a steady job put all my eggs in one back basket and just go with it. But with Boudoir, it was, the passion was there. It was like, okay, we're seeing a change in people. We're seeing how we're actually positively affecting people's lives. Like, this is something, and I wanted it. I wanted to continue helping people in that way. So it, it the only struggle and the stress was like, yes, I'm walking away from a sure thing, but it's not so much the sure thing. It was I had insurance. I had benefits. I had safe thing. It was the safe thing. You're correct. And now owning your own business is every day is a a stress headache. Like you have your good days, you have your bad days, you have your every five minutes is a different feeling, but I wouldn't change that for the world now. I mean, is this still the safe bet? No, UA was the safe bet, but I wasn't happy there. There was no more passion there. The, The passion is here and, and, and right. I don't know. What was the biggest challenge for you starting this business, for you personally? Something early on. Was there I something I still didn't want people really... to hate me. So was it? Because I was always so, like, I wanted to make everybody happy, and we made our clients happy, but, you that know. That outward image that. Yeah, it's like, I don't want people to look down on me like I'm some scum because we take pictures of people in lingerie. Like, I'm not some porn whatever person like I help people feel good about themselves no matter what they're wearing well newsflash that still happens I know but I have learned to roll with the punches and you can say whatever you want to say about me because at the end of the day I I help somebody feel better about themselves well to me that's like one of the most admirable things that's that's the thing to me that I never thought I would you would ever really get to Mm -hmm. is where you could just be like yeah I don't really care you can think what you want to think that's fine you can and I what I hate is that it took me this long to figure that out. It took me, I mean, I'm 35. I don't think I really figured that out until I was maybe 32. So really at the start of this business, I finally let go of all the cares of like what people would think about me. It's interesting because that was going to be my next question. Was oh, talking sorry. about that. Well, no, it was, it was no person in this world that ever knew you at any point in time throughout college, family, anything would have ever st- saw you doing this for a living no that you were you yeah what does that feel like I mean what was it that that helped you get to become that true version of yourself that the most authentic person because you know you wanted to take that gear off before college Mm -hmm. and you couldn't you got put into something that you didn't want to do you Mm -hmm. hated it it was definitely never for you you loved the learning aspect of it but I wanted to learn on my terms yeah you weren't yourself you got into a, a position you know, working, you know, as a career advisor and then the next position that came open, but you still really weren't yourself. You know, you weren't able to really be this person who's able to affect people in such a positive way. What helped you get to that? Because I was on my own. I'm, it it just hit me, but like, I've always been a representative for somebody else. You know, growing up, I was a representative of my parents. I always had a good, good, good grades. I always had to have good manners because I was representing my family. And then in high school, I was, you know, representing my high school. So I had to get good grades. I was on, you know, this club, that club, Spanish club, math club, whatever. I was representing those. And then um, at UA, I was representing UA. I always, you know, when we had those companies in the office. So the, the second position I had was recruiting specialist. And that was to bring these big companies like Google and, and the top four accounting firms and, and, and huge spread of these amazing companies but I was representing UA. I was making sure that, hey, if you come to campus, I'm going to give you these students that are the cream of the crop, and you're going to want to hire them. So I was, I was having to represent somebody else, and it just hit me. But, like, with this our business, I'm, I'm finally well, representing me. You're also – And you. You're also – yeah, this is very true. You represent me too. But, but – 
but you. <laughs> it's for the first time that I really and truly am doing something for me. Right. Well, when you're talking to all these big companies about these students, you were also lying your ass off because you're like, oh, this person's an asshole. This person sucks at life. This person's terrible. This we person's some, entitled. We had some really good students. You did have some awesome ones, But, too. you know, it's the same thing. It's like the people who are doing the bonus points don't need the bonus points. Right. So. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that it took you all the time to get to figuring out where you are. I mean, look, you know, we both started this business when we were plus 30, mm-hmm. right? So many people would write off and say, no, right? Like, I, if I'm doing a business, I have to start here. I have to do this. What was that like almost starting over a whole new life at 30? I was okay with it because I had so many other experiences that I felt like I wasn't starting over. I felt like it, I, I really felt like it was just, okay, next chapter. You're just transitioning. I, I was transitioning. It was a new chapter. Hell, it may have been a new book. I mean, it was sure. a new book. Let's call it a Plus, new book. Yeah. But I had all the knowledge from all those other books and those other chapters that it it did not feel like starting over. It was definitely starting fresh. It well, was like it was starting new. Well, you went from just writing a, a book to writing an autobiography, essentially. I mean, yeah. you're actually doing what you're doing. Yeah. You're doing what you want to be in your And I think that's like, you know, I was so happy to be doing what I wanted, not what they wanted me to do. You know, I didn't have to worry like my dad always wanted me to do be a lawyer and I never wanted that for myself. And, you know, at UA I, I you know, business professional every single day because, you know, it's this, that or that. And it's so refreshing to actually be you, do you, for you. For the rest of my life. Right. So. I think it's incredible. I, what is it like, though, being you in the position you are? Because so many people look up to you. I don't know why. <laughs> I know why. <laughs> like, you, you told me this the other day, and I'm like, y'all, like, if y'all really knew me, y'all, like, what? I, th- I think it's but. fun that this shy, you know, non-confident person their entire life to be where you are now, to be mm-hmm. the person that you really are the face of the business. And I mean, the business can't operate without you. It is, it is physically impossible. It could not operate. I'm an idiot. I need you. You're not an idiot. But you really are why people book sessions with us. You know, I can, I can say the things and do the things and, and be myself, but I mean, you really are that person that gives these women that feeling like, okay, they can do this too. And... I mean, how is it? Do you feel like you get imposter syndrome? Every day. Every minute. Like, I don't, to me, I'm me. I don't know how else to say it. Like, Authentically you. I'm me. You either like it or you don't. But the fact that these women are trusting me to help change their lives and some, even, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I'm giving them a day to just do for them. Because I went my entire life doing for everybody else and doing for me, it was about time. And having these women do for them, it's about time. But I see it as I'm giving them the chance to be whoever they want to be for that day. Like, I wish somebody would have given me the chance. And for them to tell me that, like, I'm just like, I didn't do anything. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm still, I haven't. I'm not there yet with the words. That's okay. <laughs> I'm still figuring you, that part out. You know from experience what it's like to put everybody ahead of yourself. Look, I mean, being a mom, having the kids, and, and you know, it doesn't matter where I am, what I'm doing. I could be doing nothing. It's going to be mom. Hey, mom, mom, mom. It's mom. always say mom. Bruh. Like, it's oh, always the bros. Something. The bros have started, it, it, yes. It is. It really is all you, but everybody, you know, looks to you and the family and uh, as – you know, hey, we all, you're kind of the anchor for everybody in the house. Which I guess is weird because, you know, I still view that as like your grandmother or, Mm -hmm. you know, like my grandmother, like they were the ones who held the family together. And I'm at that point in my life where I'm 35 and I'm helping hold our family together. You're the one that's doing definitely. I even have imposter syndrome about that. Like, do my kids really think I'm the best mom? Like, I pay you to say that. (laughs) But the thing is, you know what it's like because you're not a go out and buy things kind of person. You're not a go mm-hmm. out and do things for yourself. I've had to literally force you forever yeah. to just, hey, 
sit the fuck down, play this game, and do nothing. I love my Harry Potter game. But I think that's one of those things that I love about you is I see a lot of people that are super materialistic. You've never been that, not one time. But you really are the embodiment of what it means to be a mom, in my opinion, because you've always put the kids first as in, in doing everything that you can to put them in the right place for success. You're, if you need to study with them, you study with them, but you're also trying to do all the things. You're also trying to make sure that food's done and, and that you've got everything right now. The, you know, it's, it's business, then it's food, then it's trying to deal with the kids, and then it's dealing with you know, more business, and then it's back to kids, and then the kids are in bed, but now it's back to you know, business, or it's, or it's me, or it's whatever, and then you're neglecting yourself, and you're not taking that time for yourself. And we're not, we're not going to talk about <laughs> that part. <laughs> but the thing is, you, you've gotten better about that. I have. And I have, I have grown in the self-care I've department. always told you, and I've, I've told you, I mean, I have to do it multiple times a week where I still say, like, okay, stop. Go do this. Well, again, that tunnel vision, like, you know, I got, I got to get it done. I got but it, and, you know. So many moms live that life, too, and you can relate to that on that on an extreme level. I know what it's like to be dealing with everybody else's problems that you forget to take a bath. Right. <laughs> That's very true. As sad as that is, like, hey, it's been three days. I don't remember if I showered yeah. because I'm so busy running around with everybody. And I get that. Like, there's so many moms out there who have that same struggle. They, you know, they may have four kids. I got two. Like, I can not imagine having four kids. Right. You know, so it's like I get that at some point there needs to be a day that is focused on them. And if they're not a mom, they're just a nurse or a student or whatever. Like we get so bogged down with social media and the day-to-day lives and the business and the work that they have to like take a minute and breathe. I think that's what's so important that I can't stress enough is taking time for yourself. Like I've watched that with you over 15 years and eventually you get so overwhelmed that you can't do anything else. You can't help anybody because you have to be able to do for yourself. And it seems like that's the worst time and that's the absolute best time to stop and to mm-hmm. take a break. And that's something that you've learned throughout the years and mm-hmm. probably learned the hard way more often than not. But it's when everything feels like it's falling apart, you you have to be there. You can't take a second. That's when you need to take a second. Mm-hmm. And you've done a phenomenal job of working with our clients over you know the last four and a half years or so of – helping people realize that they need to do for themselves and that, you know, I understand the financial burden of wanting to do all the things for your kids and your family and making sure that's all there, but you still have to spend money on yourself. You still have to, because you're the kind of person who you won't buy shoes for yourself. You won't buy clothes for yourself. It's just like, oh, well, the kids need this, or, hey, you need this. You go buy this. You go get this, but you won't do that for you. And, you know, that's something that I'm thankful that you sort of realized over time. Like, hey, I need to at least if I if there's something that I, I need to do it. Mm-hmm. And, I, I definitely it's a have learned. Relationship yeah, it, it really is. And you know, there was for the longest time I never did anything for myself. I never. I mean, I didn't grow. I didn't need new clothes. I didn't care what the style and the fashion was. I was never really trendy or anything. Like, I mean, like, look at me now. I'm finally stepping outside of my comfort zone. Like, I'm in you know trendy clothes now, but. That was not who I was for a really long time. And then when it was you showing me it, like, hey, if you want it, just get it. And I got it. And I was so much happier. I was like, even if I didn't need it, even if it was like $20 more than I wanted to spend, and I'm like stressing over the money, but like, I really wanted it. And I got it. And I'm so much happier that I have it, whatever it was. I don't even know. But, you know, yeah. it's. Taking the time out of your day, even if it's five minutes, and just doing for you, everybody needs that. Everybody needs that that time. I love it. I agree. Well, in closing, I want to ask, is there, if you're talking to yourself, maybe a person who sort of feels stuck in a place, whether it's, <laughs> a small town or maybe they're stuck and maybe it could be a big city. They just feel stuck and they feel like they're not able to live as themselves. They're not living the life that they want to live. Was there something that you would say as somebody who has 
I don't know if there's just one thing I could say. I think it's definitely a conversation thing. It's what, why do you feel like you're stuck? What is holding you back? There's something deeper there. Is it, you know, are you really living for yourself or are you living for somebody else? And if you're living for somebody else, that's, that's the problem right there. You, you quit it, quit. Um, cause I did that and it sucks. And at some point you're going to break down. You can't live for somebody else. You have to live for you. But like, if you don't like your, your city, go find another one. If you don't like your job, go find, I mean, I know easier said than done, but go find another job. You know, it's, you're not stuck. You think you're stuck, but you're not. So like, I mean, I felt stuck in that small town. I got myself out. I felt stuck in that job. I got a new job. I felt stuck with, you know, friends, go get new friends. You know, it's, it's, if something doesn't feel right, have the deep conversation with yourself and figure out what it is and then do the opposite. I love it. So. I think this is the best way to end this. I appreciate you. You were, you were the perfect guest. No. Okay. Well, I think you were. I appreciate you. <laughs> I, I, I do enjoy getting to do life with you. Every day. I do too. Some days. Every day. Most days. All the days. Okay. Well, I I was I've, I've been trying to find a uh, a good sign off. For, I mean, I I love the steadily backing away from the camera. Do I keep backing away. I mean, I was gonna do that, but you lost the audio. I did. I did. I didn't lose it. Uh, the Roadcaster Pro lost it. I hope this is working. If it isn't, I am going to be highly upset. Actually, if this doesn't, if this one didn't work, I'm not even gonna be mad. It's just gonna be comical at this point. We just probably third time's the charm, but it's we'll not do, happening tomorrow. We'll do this again five I years. I will from change now. my outfit. Yeah. Oh no, 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 no! You would have to do it again in the same outfit. Um, well, I love you. I appreciate you for our I listeners. I hope that. Oh, wait, were you loving me or are you loving the listeners? No, I said you. Okay, I love you too. I mean, I love the listeners. I Look, mean, hey, I don't know. I'm so good. If you're if you're listening to this, I appreciate you. If you watch this, listen to it, whatever it is, I cannot stress enough how much I appreciate the support. Rachel and I have had so many messages and texts and calls and stuff from people, even though we're only getting like 70 views. If there's look, if you if if I say if three people did, that's that's a lot to me. That's a huge huge deal. I I honestly can't thank everybody enough. Uh, but we're going to be back doing some awesome things soon. Did you need to mention your next guest? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's coming. We'll see. Oh, it's a surprise. We'll see Thursday. Yeah, okay. All righty. Are you going to back away? Oh, am I? Oh, I get to let you get to back away this time. You can back away. <laughs> <That's so hot. laughs> I think I'm still in the camera. I don't know. <laughs>